This is a special podcast presentation from 700WLW.com. This is Doc Thompson On Demand. Do you have a bunch of credit card debt or other debt? How'd you like a new car? Well, if you have a bunch of debt, I mean a lot of it, and you're planning on spending even more, you know, you're, you're not... You're not bringing in enough money. I have a way you can get a free car. Absolutely free car. That is coming up this morning at about 10.06. About one hour from right now. If you have some debt and you don't think that's going to change anytime soon, I have a way you can get a brand new luxury automobile absolutely free. One hour from now. Bottom of the hour, about 10.33. SpongeBob is apparently making your kids stupid. It's not you. It's not your lineage. It's not hereditary, it's Spongebob. Short attention span, just after watching minutes of Spongebob. We'll get an update on what exactly that means in the new study, what it said from a uh, representative from the University of Virginia, coming up at about 9.33. Doesn't it seem reasonable that a union president who is working for the union get paid by the union? That the dues collected by the members of the union go to pay the salary? It just seems incredibly reasonable to me. If you're a member of a union, by all means, tell me what I'm missing here. 513-749-7800, the big one, or pound 700 on AT&T. That just seems reasonable. It's It's not common. In fact, it's pretty common that the people end up doing the job. They're, they're doing the same job with the people they represent often. They're getting paid from the city or county or whatever. I recognize these things are negotiated as part of contracts, but isn't it reasonable if you're doing the union work, you you get paid by the union? You're not really an employee then of the city or county. You're not really working for them. I suppose you could say indirectly you are by organizing and taking care of all of those people in the union that are doing that job. But really you're working for the union. And I see a definite conflict of interest there. Unfortunately, it happens quite often that the citizens end up paying the people who work for the union. Such was the case with Diana Fry. She was doing about half her work for the union and the other half for the, for the sewer district. I think it's incredibly reasonable. So when the uh, city manager, Milton Dahoney, said that he really wanted that to be the case in the future, that the unions would pay for their their union, you know, presidents and whatever, the people doing the work for it. He got some good reaction from some of the unions in the city and some kind of on the fence, we'll see. And then one said, no, we don't think it's a good idea. Ironically, the one that said it's not a good idea is code. (laughs) Code. Cincinnati organized to dedicated employees. They rejected the idea outright. Code is where Diana Fry worked. Now, I recognize they got some financial difficulties now, what with missing $750,000. And I'm sure those, those union, the people who, uh, who are union members and working do not want to have their union dues increased. Because if you got financial troubles and you're not going to get that money back anytime soon, yeah, in order to pay for that, you'd have to take a little bit more from everybody. But isn't that reasonable? Mill Dahoney asked a bunch of the different unions if they would if they would permit the presidents to devote full time to union duties and get paid for by the unions. Right now, City Hall pays more than uh, half or a little bit more than half of the president's salaries of those unions, even when they spend full time on union work. So they came up with a deal. It's 50-50, but they may be working exclusively for the unions. Code said, no, that's not a good idea. That's not something they want to do. They would prefer to continue the provision that would authorize the presidents, like it did Fry, to spend half of their time, 1,000 hours per year, on union business while drawing a full-time salary from the sewer district. Sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to say, yeah, we don't have to pay our employees the full salary. We'll, we'll get half of it someplace else. 
According to um, the interim president, he said that this time Code is not in a position to financially make that uh, make the president full time position. Nor does Code's board of directors feel that the provision warrants full time employment. Well, wait a minute. If it, if it doesn't warrant full time employment, that's that's not my concern. That's a that's union business. Either come up with more union business or less union business, and take care of it yourself. Because that's what the unions are doing. It's not bad mouthing them. That's just how it is. They they take care of the union and the the people who are in the union. Yeah, I I get it. I get it. Code has been screwed apparently, allegedly by Diana Fry. Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars missing. But why should the citizens of Cincinnati pick that up? Why should they pick up the slack? Go after Fry if she is found guilty and go get that money. In the meantime, or if you never recover that money, then you shake the jar and you tell all the union members to throw a couple more bucks in every pay. Here you go. Ching, ching, ching. We need to, we need to pay for the president. I think that's quite reasonable. Now, I got to give credit to uh, Cincinnati Firefighters Union 48. They, uh, they seemed receptive to it. Good for you. I think that's reasonable. The uh, Cincinnati FOP said that they're willing to discuss the idea. They do want to negotiate other benefits in exchange. I, I, you're right. That was a benefit that they negotiated in the past. And even if you end up giving something else up, where money goes somewhere else, the citizens are paying for that. At least there's not the, the appearance of a conflict of interest. Because if you've got the, the citizens paying for somebody who's doing half or, or more work for the union, whether it is a conflict or not, it certainly looks like it. And when you're dealing with the public and public interest, you've got to avoid even the appearance of such. The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees asked for another week to consider their proposal, according to the Inquirer. All right. I I guess they'll probably go in and negotiate, but I got to give you unions credit, the ones who said, yeah, we're open to something like that. Good for you. It's what should happen. It's an update on Diana Fry now, by the way. Uh, According to some uh, some new reports, she and some of her close relatives, during a two-year period, when she was head of code, had a bunch of different properties transferred, either sold, transferred, bought, She was some of her relatives. Now, that's not uncommon. You may go out and buy properties, flip them, sell them, rent them, whatever. Certainly nothing wrong with that. But when you've been accused of of taking $750,000 and people want to know, where the heck did that money go? Yeah, this is of real importance. And according to many people, she didn't show any outward sign. Like she was flaunting $750,000. Doesn't wearing, you know, excessive jewelry or furs or anything like that. So where did it go if she ended up taking it? Well, this could be the answer. She, with uh, some of her relatives, bought, sold, transferred about a half a dozen homes in West Price Hill. Her husband, her brother-in-law, and the LLC that they formed were responsible for the transfer sale, whatever, of the different properties. Now, in just two years, between 2007 and 2009... They took ownership or transferred ownership, six different properties valued at $75,000 and $128,000. That is a far cry from $750,000. Where is the rest of it? If she took it, where is the rest of it then? That accounts for a nice chunk, but there's still a lot more than if she really did take it. The LLC bought one house, in 2008, for 75000 they sold it a year later for 90000 Okay, flipping the house, making some cash. One of the other homes that is owned by her husband, they put in an in-ground swimming pool costing $27,000. $27,000, that's, that's a nice chunk of cash there. Still, not the $757,000 that is alleged to have been taken by her. Where is the rest of it if she took it? Are there other houses out there? Isn't it a box somewhere, a safe deposit box? 
a bank account somewhere, a Swiss bank account. Where is it? They're going to keep digging, and this is going to come up. And if she does plead guilty, and there's speculation she's working on some sort of plea deal, if that happens, she's going to have to go ahead and, and come up with some answers here. It'll be interesting to see where it shakes out. Code, I feel bad for you. I feel bad that uh, there wasn't enough oversight, that people weren't doing their job, that they let the money go missing whether she took it or not. But $757,000, if stolen from your union, that's not the problem of the citizens of Cincinnati. That's union business. That's a problem with the union. And if you need to get that $757,000 back, you need to take care of it. And if you are unable then to fully pay for your union president or other union activity, then you need to come up with some more cash yourself. And that is incentive then in the future to make sure that the people that are running your union are doing what they're supposed to do. That is incentive in the future to make sure you have true transparency, that all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted and you know where all the money is. To simply say you're not in a position right now because of past transgressions, a missing $757,000, you're not in a position to pay for your own president. I think that's outrageous. No, I, I would even be willing to, if I were a citizen of Cincinnati, to say, we'll give you, you know, a grace period. I'm not saying yank the rug out and demand that they suddenly start paying for their, their president tomorrow. Yeah, you can work with them. But there should be a plan in place to say, you've got to take care of this now. That's union business, and you should be taking care of union business. This is particularly important as we start talking about issue two. The formerly known SB5, now called uh, issue two, that'll be on the ballot this November. It's going to be more and more uh, questions about how we go forward when dealing with public unions. Unions who are are, uh, filled and staffed by people who work for the public. All of these questions are going to continue to come up. What is right? What is reasonable? What is fair? The jobs have to be done. There's plenty of things we need out there as a city, as a county, as a state, as a federal government. There's plenty of things we need to have done. So what is reasonable? What jobs truly need to be done? And what is fair pay? And I'm somebody that says, you know what, let's, re, let's reevaluate all these things that we have just said, oh, that's public, we can go ahead and do that, we can build that, we can staff that, we can fund this, we can create this organization or that organization or this agency. I think we need to reevaluate that and probably trim that on back. But at the same time, if you've got somebody that's doing a really good job, we need to plan that. We need to plan for that down the road, that if they are truly doing exceptional work, they can get paid exceptionally. These are going to be the discussions we have. But part of it has to be, you've got to pay for your union business. To say that somebody would be doing union business on taxpayer time is ridiculous and outrageous. Your call's on the way. 513-749-7800. The big one, pound 700 on AT&T. Coming up at 933, SpongeBob making your kids stupid. On the big one, 700 WLW. Fox 19 storm tracker forecast for meteorologist Frank Marzullo. You got sunny skies this afternoon, high around 85. Early showers tonight, overnight low 63. You could see some rain tomorrow. Tomorrow's high, a little bit cooler and higher on 75. 65 now at 700 WLW. If you would have uh, comments on the SpongeBob story, we're going to talk about about 933. It's on my blog at 700wlw.com. You can read it and post your comments up there as well. Do you let your kids watch SpongeBob and are you afraid that SpongeBob is making them stupid? Is he shortening their attention span? Post your comments now at 700WLW.com. I'll read some on the air coming up. I'm going to talk to a lady from the University of Virginia to get the facts on it. City Council, Cincinnati City Council voted yesterday. Stop some of the police layoffs. There was a proposal to axe 44 police jobs to get rid of them. Well, they've got to balance the budget still. And though they may not like that, it's kind of tough to do so. So the vote yesterday, they stopped it. It was four Republicans, one charter right. They approved two motions that would save the 44 police officers' jobs at this point. It likely will not come up for a vote again until after the election. Hmm. <laughs> now the mayor said uh, he's, he's probably not going to let it come up for a vote. He can he could do so for 90 days. 
keep it off the agenda for 90 days, and that would put it past the, the election. Hmm. No, I'm sure that's just a coincidence. There's politicking going on. Nothing like that. That would be outrageous to even suggest such a thing. These are all finding upstanding citizens who just wanted to serve their fellow man and do the job of an elected servant. That's all. No politicking whatsoever. So I'd like they will come up for a uh, vote until after the November 8th election. Now, here's what's going on. They say they're able to stave off the elimination of these jobs because they're able to come up with $19 million in potential savings and cuts for next year. They can come up with $19 million. My question is then, why didn't they already have the $19 million in savings and cuts for next year? Isn't it amazing how they always can do that? They're always able to, well, we found a million dollars. In this case, they found $19 million. You know where it was? In the cushions of their, uh, their, their couches. That's what, in their offices. It's all, you know, it falls out of your pocket like that. I think they found a couple of million underneath the couch. Yeah, it hits the floor and rolls back there. They were able to find those cuts and savings. Uh, there is some questions about it, and they're making some assumptions. First of all, the price of gasoline, inflation, whether it's price of gasoline, health care costs, all of these things to determine if they'll actually be able to come up with those type of savings. Some big assumptions there. Maybe not. They're assuming that the price of gas would be $3.71 per gallon. I think the average last I saw was three seventy four. dollars It likely will go down. It usually goes down in recent years anyways, toward the end of the year, maybe late fall as you head into wintertime. Healthcare costs, they're, they're assuming that it'll jump by 13%. That's what they've budgeted for. So that's a big assumption there. What if it goes up more? Now, the mayor has come out and defended the Office of Environmental Quality. I say there's a real easy place to cut. The Office of Environmental Quality. Do you really need that? You've got the Ohio EPA. What are you doing? You don't think there's any duplication of services there? Environmental quality? Come on. These are the types of things we need to get rid of. We need to stop paying for silliness like this. The Office of Environmental Quality. How much money could they save there? They're also looking at uh, some grants. Federal government is expected to go ahead and lay out some grants again for, uh, for police salaries and whatnot. And the president, of course, is pushing his jobs bill. He'll be in Ohio today. So maybe some more money's come that way. All some big assumptions, though. We'll talk about uh, his jobs plan coming up uh, oh, about 10.06 this morning as well. And uh, as he heads to Columbus to lay the entire thing out. I still heard on the news today, the president's coming to Ohio to push his jobs plan. He's not coming to push his jobs plan. He's coming to push his reelection. Why else would he go to three swing states as his first three stops? Why would he head there? Because he's not pushing the job. He's not saying to the people, listen, you need to be saying to him, you need to call your elected servants in that. But does that really matter? He's going into states that the, the Senate is, the, the six senators from those states are the majority Democrats. The districts are split. He's not going into the lion's den challenging those Republicans across the board. He's not doing that. It's swing states. He's campaigning to get reelected. SpongeBob making your kids stupid next on the big one, 700 WLW. Are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain! I can't hear you! Aye, aye, Captain! Oh! And a pineapple under the sea. Spongebob Squarepants. Absorbent and yellow and porous is he. I already feel more stupid. I didn't know it was possible, but I'm... Hey, look at that. <laughs> I'm already getting distracted. From the University of Virginia, psychology professor Angeline Lillard. How are you, ma'am? I am fine, thank you. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thanks for coming on to talk about this new study. It was first talked about or, or mentioned that I saw in the journal Pediatrics. And you've done some work on this that... If you expose kids four years of age to things like SpongeBob, they they have a shorter attention span. That's right. We found that after nine minutes of watching that show compared to nine minutes of watching a 
slow-paced educational cartoon or drawing, children were significantly impaired in their ability to concentrate, think, solve problems, and so on immediately afterwards. That just seems so unlikely to me. I mean, I, I could understand on one hand, but on the other hand, I could I could make an argument that that teaches them to be quick or something like that. That they're they're able to to transfer their thoughts quickly. Is there any finding for that? Uh, there is not. Um, it's an empirical question whether over time it might um, build up processing abilities. My guess is not because the events that are happening are so random and they're magical. They're not something that happens normally in everyday life, so you can't really learn them. Oh, uh, okay. But, um, it is an, an empirical question that we'd like to look at. So I wonder if, if it, is it the, the fact that it moves so quickly or it's not educational? Those are two separate um, strands that we, would, we want to separate out and look at. So it could be the fact that it's really fast pacing, or it could be the fact that it's fantastical and magical, or it could be both combined. And we are separating them out in the study that we're looking at now. What are the parameters of your study? Uh, the parameters meaning... But how, how did you go about it? You, you tested kids four years of age, and uh, yeah. if they watch certain programs versus others? children to come into the laboratory, and when they came in, we randomly assigned them to one of these three conditions. Um, then for nine minutes in a lab room, they either watched one of the shows or drew, and then a different experimenter who didn't know what they had done uh, for half of the children came in and went through this series of four tests of what we call executive function, common tests that are used in cognitive development and that are very predictive of how well children will be doing in, in school and the like um, down the road. And we found temporary, at least, um, decrements in the SpongeBob children. So, are, was, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, they, they were performing, you could say, at about half of the capacity of the other children just after watching the show. Now, there are yet to be any long-term studies of this to see, you know, maybe kids who are 16, how, they, how they've done if they watched it uh, versus right. kids who didn't. We'd, we'd like to do that. We'd like to look at what happens over the long term, you know, very heavy watchers versus children who don't watch it at all and, and see whether there's a difference. And by the way, it's certainly not only SpongeBob. We, we have now replicated the study with a different fast-paced fantastical cartoon and, and found the same thing. So it's just this, you know, hyper-stimulation of lots of um, incorrect information that at least is temporarily impairing them. So it's, it's just fast-paced, moving images, whatever, that, that really don't matter a whole lot. Right, and a lot of things that can't happen in real life, like when, you know, when his bed flings him out of bed in the morning by you know, get going vertical, and he lands you know, in some distant place in a lake, and he's suddenly wearing an astronaut costume. I mean, you know, that doesn't... <laughs> does that happen to you in the morning? Or like, well, I mean, that is technically possible, I guess, but... <laughs> Hey, I like when they light water, when they light fires underwater. But, 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 so you compare that to Caillou, who just, you know, gets out of bed in the morning just like they do, and that's easy to assimilate to their cognitive structures. I'm not familiar with that one. What is that one, Caillou? Caillou is a very slow-paced cartoon. It's, it's French-Canadian, I believe, about a um, boy, and, you know, it's just a four-year-old boy in his everyday life, and it's very much in terms that a four-year-old could understand. I'm not sure about that French Canadian thing, though. <laughs> Sounds all right, except for that. Oh, oh, oh. He is getting out of the bed. <laughs> um, so, wait, how would you compare this with uh, Kalu for those of us that aren't familiar with it? Um, what other shows are out there, like Adora the Explorer or something like that? Yes, yes. Dora the Explorer would be more like it, whereas. Um well, everybody knows SpongeBob, but you know, there's the Super Y shows are very fast and have a lot of magical um, things going on. Fanboy and Chum Chum is the other cartoon that we studied at this point. There, uh, I'm wondering if maybe between the ages of whatever, you know, birth and and four or five or six, we we know those ages are kids are just sponges. They just they just absorb information, and I, I'm wondering if during that time. Maybe their age dictates that they need um, information that is learning-based. And then maybe as you get older, you're able to process the information differently if it's nonsensical. Does that kind of make sense? That does, that does tend to make sense. And, you know, that would be, say, the view of um, Maria Montessori um, was somebody who had that kind of a view, that, that children initially need reality and that they build their creativity out of what's real and that they're just confused by what's not real. You know, there are studies showing that in, in some basic ways, children are pretty clear about what's real and what's not. Um, so it, that 
you know, knowing what's real might not be the problem so much as when we do watch shows, we are trying to process the information, and it's very hard to process things that aren't aren't real. So it's just more difficult maybe for them to process. Did you did you compare this um, the, the the four year olds with maybe six and eight year olds to see how they are? We we just have one study where we did uh, a six year old group as well, and they were impaired but not as badly as four-year-olds, and we do want to continue this research. And, and by the way, that study, it was a full 11-minute episode. We want to look at what happens when you watch the whole half-hour show with the commercials in it as well. What about a morning full of it, you know, <laughs> six, seven hours in a row? <laughs> right, What's that right. doing to them, right? Right. We'd, we'd like to know, you know, that it's an empirical question. It could would, go either way. Would you, with the other ones you've compared it with, would you compare that with um, cartoons? Or would it be similar to other generations, uh, um, whatever, the Smurfs in right. the 80s or, or Bugs Bunny Bugs prior Bunny to that? Bugs Bunny Roadrunner. No, we, we definitely want to do that. That's on our docket of studies that if we can get funding, we'd, we'd like to do. And, you know, one thing that's different about when I was growing up was cartoons were only on on Saturday morning. That was the only time that a child would watch them. And that's quite different from now when they are 24-7 available. That's a great point. You're right. We are, the kids are exposed to it a whole lot more. And I do see a little bit of difference. I mean, they were always nonsensical. I mean, you know, Bugs Bunny, a, a talking, walking rabbit, takes out a hatchet and hits somebody in the head with it or something, and they're fine. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, or get shot or anything like that. Um, obviously those are nonsensical, but they didn't seem to be quite as fast paced. And I know people have targeted kids knowing they have short attention spans anyways with, you know, faster paced cartoons. I, I agree. I don't think they're as fast to pace either, but we need to, to study it um, to be sure. And in terms of children's attention spans, uh, you know, we, we can sort of gear things one way or another. We can gear the world to adapt to shorter and shorter attention spans, or we can do things that try to lengthen attention spans and, you know, say read um, Nicholas Carr's The Shallows or uh, other um, recent discussions about you know what is happening to attention spans in this new world, I think there's something to be said for trying to keep them longer so people can concentrate and think. I just got an email from somebody who is familiar with Kalu. Is that it, Kalu? Caillou. Caillou, Caillou, who says that um, it's too slow for kids and that Caillou is a whiny brat who never stops whining. He whines incessantly. Do we want our kids to whine incessantly to get their way? Is that how you would characterize that cartoon? Uh, not the episode that, that we used. I mean, I guess he did whine a little bit. But I, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't watch these, I have to say, I don't watch these cartoons often. <laughs> so so I, I, I really don't know. But, it, you know, the important thing is that parents are watching the shows and really thinking about what do they want their children to be exposed to. You know, the worst is those damn wiggles. You ever see the Wiggles? No, what's that like? Oh my golly, it's it's four grown men. It's not animated. It's live action, uh-huh. I guess you'd call it. Um, four grown men who dance around and and sing to kids, and they make up these nonsensical songs about their big red car and stuff like that. It is painful for people who hated Barney. <laughs> I would watch a lifetime of Barney to one episode of the Wiggles. <laughs> Horrible. Right. Awful. So, you know, I think we do need to be selective, and parents do need to get in there and decide what they want their children to be exposed to, and you know, and know know what the outcomes might be. But you know, if it's SpongeBob that they want, they have to be careful not to then immediately ask them to do things that require self-regulation and attention, like like don't watch it on the way to school. It just doesn't seem fair to their child, given that at least immediately after watching the show, they're going to have trouble. I hope you uh, do continue and you test some of like the Bugs Bunny and stuff. That was a favorite of mine uh, growing up, a lot of the Bugs Bunny, because if it turns out that, uh, that Bugs Bunny is similar to this, uh, I could have been smarter. And <laughs> I think I have a lawsuit. I think that's, uh, that's what's coming next. <laughs> It was only once a week. Yeah. Uh, from the University of Virginia Psychology, Professor Angela Lillard, I appreciate the information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have yourself a great day. Do you buy it? Do you, do you think it's actually shortening? The, I mean, they've got the information, or do you see a bit of an ad- agenda here? I'm not, uh, Caillou, I'm not familiar with that. I'm familiar with some of them. Some of them are, are awful and painful. Some of them I can tolerate more. SpongeBob was one I could actually, not all SpongeBob. I am a SpongeBob purist. I don't want those new SpongeBobs. I want the original, the early ones, the classics. The classics.
Not those new ones now where his voice has changed. It's like when Bugs Bunny's voice changed. And the same thing with Fairly Odd Parents. I like the early ones, the classics. Your call's next on the big one, 700 WLW. Doc Thompson on the big one, 700 WLW. I got two more emails saying the same thing about Caillou, that he's just a big whiner. Jeff, are you familiar with this show? No, thank God I'm not. And I'm really not familiar with your guest. But let's start out that anytime someone comes on and the octave of their voice goes up about nine times every time you ask a question that she may not like to answer, <laughs> don't trust them. And it's just like the same problem we have every single day in academia across the country. And she was. Well, so well hang on a second, Jeff. When you say academia, I, ho- I wish you would say it like this academia. <laughs> academia. Yeah, I hope you do that. Uh, you know, okay. you, you, it, it's just like you get an aeronautical engineer, he'll tell you a bumblebee can't fly because the wing space doesn't generate enough updraft. Well, those little suckers go. But here's the deal. She was so telling about two-thirds through your conversation when you ask her about Bugs Bunny or Mighty Mouse or Woody Woodpecker or something. She goes, oh, if we could get more funded. That was the whole story right there in a nutshell, pal. Okay, who is the idiot that ever funded a lady to study cartoons to begin with? You know, I think oh, that's a job I could have had, Jeff. You know, let me tell you. Did anyone that you knew, I don't know, and I know I'm a little older than you, you know, we watched Superman and Mighty Mouse. We didn't. We might have put the towel on and ran around the kitchen, but we know we weren't going to fly. It was, it was just a little fantasy and a little fun. I don't think any kid's any smarter or any dumber than watching Mighty Mouse save the world or Superman uh, stop engines with, you know, it's it just, it's entertainment. Maybe it's you, maybe you don't know you're going to fly, Jeff, but I'm still holding out. Well, you know I'm, what, and, and, and there may like be a good back to the future, but what's so funny about this, they'd say, oh, you know, don't look at Dick Tracy. You know, no one's ever going to talk in an instrument the size of your wrist to talk across the country. And now? We're doing it now, aren't we? Yeah, there is something to be said. I think even some of those nonsensical cartoons can be quote-unquote educational. I learned stuff from them. I, I learned the inside joke that was going on. I felt a part of it. But if you have comments, we'll take them next. And also, if you are familiar with Caillou, please tell me about this show. Now I am curious. It's Doc Thompson on the big one, 700 WLW. I guess when it came to educational cartoons when I was growing up, it'd be like, Mr. Rogers? I didn't like Mr. Rogers. I felt like he was talking down to me. But the captain. Oh, I like the captain. I was in on the joke. I was waiting for that stupid moose and rabbit to get hit with those ping pong balls. I was waiting day after day. Scott and Delhi, how are you? Hi, Doc. Uh, I've seen Caillou with my son, and I think he probably watched a total of three episodes before he realized it's uh, the most boring, milk toast cartoon there is. It's just, it's god awful. It's just, you know, don't watch TV, just, you know, walk around your house and look at the dishes and talk to your mom that's caillou it's there's no there's nothing, nothing to, to it uh, yeah it's like this safe little kid who lives in a bubble and you know he just he goes to the park and he flies a kite and he comes home and that's like an episode does he does he whine though because i'm he getting more whine. and more he, he, of these from people saying he whines yeah he whines and you know this woman there you know they measure you know first of all i'm not going to let my kids watch cartoons and then send them off to school right away anyway but I mean, what about the imagination? You know, of something like SpongeBob. You know, they're not me- they're not just trying to see what kind of imagination this sparks. I mean, according to her, you you shouldn't let your kids watch Wizard of Oz because you know how- that's some heads going fantastic. All that a house could fly in the air in a tornado and then land in a and you know and then all of a sudden everything's in color and there's this land of little munchkins. I mean, yeah, I think there's know, something to be said for all of that. Yeah, there is. I mean, it makes ki- kids think. I mean, you don't take your kid to the art museum and only let them look at the still. Life. They look at the Picasso and, you know, the, the Salvador Dali, and it makes them think. You know, it's, it's not just all about what's in the real world. And you know what? Watching some things that are, that are a little bit older, I'm not talking about, you know, inappropriate older. I'm just talking about things that are a little more advanced. Kids absorb some of that stuff, too. I, I'm the youngest in my family. I have, you know, three older sisters and a brother. And I was constantly challenged to be in conversations with them and my folks and, you know, what was going on. So I, I think there's an advantage there, too. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you got to stretch the, limit, the limits of a kid's imagination and intellect, and by, you know, just letting them watch one little safe thing. You know, these are the same parents who are helicopter parents and won't let their kids play with toy guns and, you know, or go down the big slide because they're afraid they're going to get hurt. Those are the people that let their kid watch Caillou. So I'm wondering if it's, it goes back to that, uh, that famous quote, the famous Bible, in all things moderation. That's, 
absolutely true, Doc. I appreciate the okay. call, buddy. Yeah. Thanks so much. In all things moderation, sure, they may get something from Caillou, but maybe they'll get something from the other stuff, too. Listen, if your kids are eating nothing but candy bars and Coke, and they're watching SpongeBob 16 hours a day, probably not real good for them. But a little bit here and there, I think it's that big of a deal. You know, expand their horizons a little bit. Expose them to a lot of stuff. Do you really think that's hurting your kids that much? This reminds me a little bit, and this was why I was a little skeptical about the study. It reminds me a little bit of all of those those people for the last 30 years who've said, cartoons are violent. If kids watch the violence on TV, they're going to be more violent. Is it more violent because of Bugs Bunny? I got the difference. I never picked up a, an anvil and dropped it on my sibling's head. Never once. I knew that would hurt him and I would be in trouble. <laughs> I got that. But I saw it in the cartoons. Your call's on the way. It's Doc Thompson on the home of the Reds. 700 WLW Cincinnati. 